And one of the things we have to understand is that the grace of God, the King, who is offering mercy, can offer it to whomsoever He wills. It's not dependent on us to earn mercy. If you can earn your way, like some people I met this week who thought that oh, being good or doing some of those things would, would, would earn their place in heaven in some sense, combined with some mercy of God. If you can earn anything and make God do anything, you make God into a genie. When God's a genie, He's no longer the king. Who controls genies in Aladdin or stories of that type? It's the person with the wishes, right? God's not a genie. He's not, he's not someone that we say, oh, I wish this or I wish that or God, you need to do this for me. No. God is the king. He commands you. And when you disobey God, He is the one that has the right to extend you mercy. And the question I have for you, why don't you come to God like Rahab? Why don't you come to God like Ruth? Why don't you come to God like David? Why don't you come to God like Abraham who believed and was the friend of God? Why don't you come to God like anyone who had these faith? Hezekiah. You remember Hezekiah? Hezekiah was during the time of captivity and, and, and or, or just before he, the, 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 the nation of Assyria was attacking and, and he would make a deal with them and, but he would always he was a man who restored the word of God. He restored the word of God to the life of Israel but the one thing he did he made a treaty with Assyria and, and took all the gold off the temple and everything and tried to give it to them to buy some sort of peace. You can't buy peace with God. You can't do it today. You don't have enough money to buy peace with God. In fact, God says, Come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Come, He says in the Old Testament, without money, buy and eat. See, the grace of God... And the grace of God is extended to Gentiles, to Israelites, to sinners, to people who fail. Look at the name uh, Jeho uh, Jeconiah. Jeconiah was one of the last, the last king, and he was a man who was said, in, in, I believe it was in Jeremiah chapter 22. You can look that up as you go home today. Just look up, read Jeremiah 22, probably verse 24 through 30. It was said to him that his children would, would not inherit the throne of David. And some people say that Jesus is an illegitimate king because here was a man who was cursed by God in Jeremiah chapter 22. I'll, I'll go ahead and read just verse 30 for you. But this is what it says. And, well, I'll read verse 28 through 30. It says, But this man... Uh, uh, Kononiah, which is the same man, a despised and broken pot, a vessel no one cares for. Why is he and his children hurled and cast into the land that they do not know? Meaning they were taken away into captivity. O oh, land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not succeed in his days. For none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling against Judah. One of the things that people who, who, who say that Jesus is not the Messiah, Jesus is not the Christ, is this prophecy concerning, uh, which we were talking about in, chapter, in, in Matthew chapter 1, verse 11, uh, Jeconiah, is that he was a cursed man. As I looked at that, I, I thought to myself, how can Jesus be the Messiah if there's a person in his lineage that is cursed? But that curse was not permanent. If you read the passage closely, it concerns as long as he lives. It was to his children, immediate children. But God included his name in this genealogy. Again, to show that the grace of God and the mercy of God is extended not only to sinners, not only to Israelites, not only to Gentiles, but also to people who are cursed. 
who lives are a mess, who lives are terrible. Jesus also extends His mercy and grace to people who are nobodies. I mean, how many people have heard of Nishan and Nishan, the father of Solomon? Have you heard of them? Have you studied them in your devotional times lately? But probably not. Look at verse 9, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and it goes on and on and on. You see these name after name after name, and we have little information about them. Many of them were kings. But the most amazing fact is this. If you look at verses 1 through 6, separated by 7 through 11 and 12 through, through 16, are the three eras that Jesus talks about right here. Matthew talks about 14 generations, 14 generations, 14 generations. There's a generation of the rise of the kingdom. There's a generation of the fall of the kingdom. And there's a generation of the captivity of the kingdom. All of these men and women were part of the lineage of Jesus Christ. They were in need of His mercy. They were in need of His grace. Mary was in need of His grace. She, who, who knew who Mary was? Who knew who some of these men who were in the line of Jesus were? But Jesus was the son of Abraham. He was the son of David. And Jesus is the king over time. No matter where these men and women lived, whether they lived before the enslavement to Israel or to Egypt, whether they lived after the enslavement to Egypt, whether they lived after they came out of Egypt, whether they lived in the divided kingdom or the united kingdom or the kingdom held in captivity by Babylon or Syria, or whether they had come back like Zerubbabel. How many of you study and, and have your quiet time on Zerubbabel? There was a great man of God. Man who came back and was in charge of building the king and building the, the system in Jerusalem, all the, the infrastructure back again. And here was a godly man. But they were nobodies many times. We read about them here and there in the Bible. But the reason why this genealogy is so important the reason why this genealogy, and we could go on and look at name after name after name after name, is what I want you to understand. Is it like the tracks that were laid down before the foundation of the world? That Jesus was going to die for His own people. He was going to die for all those who would believe in Him. That the gospel has not changed. It has the same kingdom, and it's the same kingdom as it always has. And it is meant for you and for me to understand that if we are members of a different kingdom, we are members of a kingdom of darkness. Regardless of what we may say, what we may be doing, if we were a member of a different kingdom than the kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we are a kingdom of darkness and the punishment for that kingdom will be death and will be judgment and will be wrath. It will happen. But when we meet God and we are in the kingdom of light, if we are in the kingdom of light, we will receive mercy and grace and goodness from God. You see, how does one get from one kingdom to another kingdom? You recognize that the kingdom of God is the kingdom of Christ. You recognize that God who has told you what to do in His law and His prophets, when He says that don't lie, don't steal, don't commit adultery. You realize that that is from the kingdom of God and you will be judged for that and that all you can do is because you have committed those crimes is ask mercy for the king. And remember I said it's the king's prerogative to give mercy. If it's going to be well for you, it is better to live in the kingdom of light because you may be having a little fun in the kingdom of darkness over here, but there will be one day when that kingdom of darkness will destroy you. Where that kingdom of darkness will fail you. Even in this life, it will fail you. Because there will be trials and difficulties and, and disasters in your life that you cannot 
cope with yourself. And there will be a time when you have to stand before God and God will, will ask you to give account for the things you have done in your body. And when you cannot give an account for the things you've done in your body, He will be forced and He will be mandated to judge you based upon your deeds. But if you are in the kingdom of life, or the kingdom of light, you do so by asking God for His mercy. That's all you do. You say, have mercy on me. I believe. I don't want to live in the kingdom of darkness. I want to live in the kingdom of light. I want to live in the kingdom of God's Son. I want to live in the kingdom of Abraham. I want to live in the kingdom of, of David. I want to live in the kingdom of Mary or the kingdom of Rahab or the kingdom of Boaz. I want to live where they are living because they have received grace and not judgment. If you've ever taken a test where everybody failed or you've ever given a test where everybody failed. I remember we, we would we'd take tests and in accounting, the, the highest grade one time in our, one of our tests was like a 28. This was like with you know, maybe 50 or 60 people in the class. Highest, highest grade was 28. And so the professor would say, well, I'm going to give everybody 25 and above A's. I'm going to give everybody 20 and above B's and everybody else fails. And everybody 20 and below were saying, well, that's not fair. The professor had the right to do that. God has the right to be merciful to you. He said he would. If you ask, would you pray with me?